Hi guys. Um, I'm really excited to be here on this panel with this incredibly amazing and diverse group of women. I wanted to point that out first and foremost. Um, we're here to talk about the concept of beauty and how it's changed over the past five to ten years and how the business of beauty has changed over the past five to ten years. Um, uh, my name is Sherry Skorka. I actually work for a company called Stage 13. We're part of Warner Brothers Digital Networks Group. We do short form digital content um, that really focuses on a multi-dimensional young person and um, their passion points and their interests. And um, what brought me to beauty and fashion was I, that is one of the biggest interests of young people. It's um, become a mega billion dollar industry. and. Um, we were fortunate enough to meet uh, Dana Bomar, who's on this panel, along with her partner, Laura Ariano, uh, who for Melt Cosmetics. And we were able to do a show following uh, the lives of young female entrepreneurs so, um, in the beauty space. So um, I wanted to, uh, I'll start with Dana since, since I uh, know her very well. Um, you started Melt as a uh, social digital brand. And uh, social is your marketing and you sell project, the pro uh, your products almost exclusively online. You're celebrating your fifth anniversary this month and your business model has not changed. Can you uh, talk about um, being a social digital brand? So it's, oh, um, hello. Is that on? No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting to be here five years from when we started because when we started a digital beauty brand, uh, the word influencer on social media didn't exist. We didn't even know what we were creating. We just knew we had a passion for makeup and we wanted to share that with people. And fortunately for us, a ton of people supported us. Millions of people follow us on Instagram. And I think the most exciting part of that is influence used to only be for large corporations. And now anyone with a cell phone can be influential. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, steal a little a quote from a study done by um, Moj Madara and her team at BeautyCon that over 80% of young people, and um, she defined them as pivotals, which you can explain, um, say beauty isn't just about products, it's about cultural expression. So I think the beauty industry has changed dramatically from when I was a kid, when it was just about these big brands and a few beauty ideals. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, BeautyCon and, and the types of people you work with now and, and, uh, and, and the study that you did, the FOMO study? Sure. Hi. This is this hot? Ooh. <laughs> really hot. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Moj. Um, I got involved in BeautyCon originally as an investor. Um, I don't wear makeup, so I'm not a um, super uh, into cosmetics person, but what drew me to um, the business and the industry is as someone who has always been pretty obsessed with the concept of commerce and content. Um, I'd never really seen an industry harness the power of content, video, communication, and community in the way in which the beauty industry has done it. Um, and so four years ago, um, I invested in this company that was originally a content creator meetup space, and we pivoted the business towards a community-driven festival. And then we launched a media business, and since then we've been launching consumer goods. So I think uh, what has been fascinating to me about the beauty industry is the sort of like the democratization of like content and commerce and influence and how you have all of these amazing young influencers who uh, would never be on the cover of Cosmo or Vogue or Vanity Fair uh, with, you know, could be anywhere from 100,000 followers to three million, five million followers now driving these massive businesses um, that are now being chased by every sort of large private equity, venture capital business um, on a global level. And so I think beauty is such an interesting thing because you know, when you think about the fact that 84% of women do not believe that they themselves are beautiful, 
Uh, when, when you think about the stats that like 96% of women believe that their girlfriend is a really beautiful, but they're not, you know? Um, this, this sort of um, self-loathing that people have been programmed with for generations has now been really challenged, and the reason it's challenged is um, there, there's a sea of beautiful faces um, driving influence through where we spend most of our time. I mean, Gen Z spends, you know, they check their phone about 180 times a day. Um, and so this is really like the culture. And, and what I love about what's going on with the beauty industry is I think the beauty industry is now reshaping everyone's perspective on what beauty is. And you're seeing um, ethnicities and diversities and gender really, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you're seeing lots of beautiful um, expressions of beauty, and beauty is now no longer about how thin you are and you know how Caucasian you are, um, but it's about your expression of your most powerful and potent self. And it's turned out to be, you know, uh, I think the, per, the projected uh, size of this of this uh, industry by 2022 is, you know, um, 750 billion dollars. So it's it's a good industry to be in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I love that there's so much empowerment around beauty and the concept of beauty has changed so much since I was an uh, insecure teenager. Um, so next I'd like to introduce Alejandra Hernandez, who is also somebody I've had the pleasure of working with, um, who took a passion for styling and is now both a celebrity stylist as well as a designer of her own um, athletic brand, Athleisure. And uh, so I wanted to ask you how, um, you know, social media has made everyone into models, like stylists, you know, through Instagram. How do you um, brand yourself and set yourself apart from others? I think being a stylist in 2018 with Instagram has made it a little cliche. Uh, especially celebrity styling is so much about, you know, street style. And for me, I use social media not so much to showcase my work, but to showcase more of my point of view. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about something political on Instagram. I'm not afraid to show a picture of inspiration. And it's, ref I, I've had people come up to me and tell me that it's refreshing or, I've, you know, I've, I did a really big campaign with Nike last year, and part of it was because I had the creative director had noticed that like four years ago I went on a like spree of posting Teen Angel artwork. So, you know, just I think for me that's how I set myself apart from other stylists cool. on social media. <laughs> um, so Rosie Cordero is an amazing journalist whose byline has been everywhere. Oh, look at you. Nice. Oh. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone should have an entourage. Um, <laughs> so how have you seen the beauty and lifestyle space um, change over the past five to ten years as you as coming into it as somebody covering the space? I don't want to date, like, date myself here, but... Um, Three years ago, <laughs> two years ago? No, but I, I would like to take it even further because growing up, I was obsessed with magazines and there was never anybody in magazines that looked like me. And uh, even less so with makeup. I would see CoverGirl and these big brands and, you know, they would have Christy Brinkley. And in my mind, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to look fabulous like Christy Brinkley. And then I would pick from the, you know... Pale, paler, and like ashy, ashy black, right? And it was like, wait, this is this is not me. So um, throughout the years, there's been such a huge change in um, color availability, and you know that caters to so many people. And you know, I was telling Dana earlier, it took for Melt to create my perfect red lipstick. And to me, happiness is a red lipstick. <laughs> Judge me all you want. The red lipstick. <laughs> Please never discontinue it. Uh, no, so just for you. <laughs> that's why independent brands are are as important as the mass market um, because you know you ca you're catering to different people, and uh, so I think beauty is very powerful uh, for many of the points that you were saying. Whether you choose not to wear it or you choose to you know to wear a full face of it and. Uh, I can't wait to continue to see the evolution of makeup and uh, and and for it to be continue to be inclusive for for everybody. 
Thank you. <laughs> so just to wrap up, and this is for um, whoever wants to take this. So how is the empowerment of beauty like driven your brand? How how is the 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 marketing of your brand changed because of all of these new faces and new voices um, in the space? I guess I guess marketing for us has been so different than a huge corporation because we are so publicly, my partner and I, the faces of our brand. So we connect personally with every customer. And that piece I think is so crucial now. They don't want to see a faceless corporation. They want to know our lives. We created these products because we cared about them and how we use them in our everyday. And that piece, I think, has totally changed and I don't think will go away. I don't think we'll ever go backwards and not care about the people behind the brands, what they believe, what they think, what they care about. And it really makes it more inclusive that everyone is included, everyone is a part of the conversation, nobody is left out, every comment matters. I, I think that is so important. That's cool. um, and, and I wanted to ask um, how you decide which influencers or other people to partner with, specifically Moj. I, I noticed that you know you partner with different brands. Whether I saw Melody Asani is on there, I'm a big fan of hers. And um, you know, how do you decide who to partner with um, now that there is such a large landscape of people to look at? I mean, I think at the end of the day, I always think about whether or not we share similar value system because I think we live in a time in where you as a brand are going to be held accountable for the choices you make and who you work with and I'm accountable to uh, a, my entire audience is uh, a lot of young kids and their parents and so they look up to us and so I think that's a huge piece of it. Um, Data really plays a big part of our decision making and, and really thinking about, you know, working with partners like Tribe Analytics and thinking about how, um, like, sort of what influencers are on the rise and where and what and why. And I think we're always trying to make sure that we're being as inclusive as we possibly can be. Um, and you're never really inclusive enough in this day and age, right? I think people are so passionately fighting to be understood right now like the public wants to be understood for their authentic self so I think we're constantly pushing the boundaries on what does authentic mean what does inclusive mean um, and really trying to make sure that we're not always just choosing creators based on how many followers they have or what their engagement is but also um, you know I think about this one in our study FOMO this concept of niche is the new mass like some of the most powerful audiences are very niche audiences and those niche audiences drive huge community for us. I mean, the reason we're able to sell out 25,000 person venues without you know, a huge marketing spend and big partners um, is because we go deep with many niche audiences and communities and we've built an ongoing relationship with them. Very cool. Thank you guys, thank you very much.